Welcome to the Calvary Bible Church online worship experience for Sunday, May 17th, 2020. Thanks for watching. Please join us in worship. We have created a free app for your device, and you can download that app at calvaryapp.com. In fact, I want to uh, encourage you to take a moment right now and take out your device and go into the app and tap on the Sunday tab, and then tap on the front of the virtual response card and take a minute and fill out the front of that virtual response card so that we can know who watched this service with us. Today's message comes from Philippians 4, 4 through 9, and I encourage you to turn there in your Bible. Also, if you want to take notes or if you want to just follow along the pass in your app, you can go ahead and tap on the Today's Message icon in the app, and that will show you um, the passage I'll be speaking from this morning, as well as give you an opportunity to take some notes as you follow along with the message for this morning. This is session 32 of A Better Brand of Happiness. In this session, we will be looking and continuing to look at the paragraph that is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Now, just a quick review. In session 30 of, this, uh, of these sessions on A Better Brand of Happiness, I demonstrated the first steps in my Bible study method on this paragraph, Philippians 4, 4 through 9. We read the text. We established why it begins at verse 4 and ends at verse 9, and we discovered the big idea. And that big idea in statement form, after we discovered it, was 
When you rejoice in the Lord, it will make you gentle, prayerful when anxious, intentional in your thinking, and obedient to God's word. Finally, in session 30, we looked in detail at the first verse of this paragraph, Philippians 4.4, 4, which says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And so that was two sessions ago in session 30. Now, in the previous session, session 31, we looked in detail at Philippians 4.5. And that verse, you'll recall, was Philippians 4.5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Now, in today's session, session 32, we come to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. So that'll be the focus, beginning the focus of today's session, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And whenever you read the Bible, I recommend you read the passage that you want to study over and over again to get very familiar with what it says. And so let's start our study in this session by reading the entire paragraph together, again, Philippians 4, 4 through 9, and I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. In the previous session, session 31, I showed you that there are six imperatives, six verbs of command in this paragraph. There are six of them. And let me just quickly review. One of them is used twice in verse 4, and that is the word rejoice. That's the first command that we find in this passage. The second one we come to is be evident. That's the one we looked at in detail last time. That's our second imperative in this uh, paragraph. The third and fourth one, I said, form a compound imperative, and those are the words, be anxious and present. And so those are numbers three and four in our list of commands. The next one is all the way down in verse eight, and it's all the way at the end of the verse where it says, think about such things. That's number five in these uh, in these series of imperative verbs. Finally, the sixth one is in verse 9, and it is translated, put into practice. That's the, the uh, sixth command in, these, in, this, um, in this list, put into practice. And so we have six imperative verbs in this paragraph. But because two and verse seven, or verse six, I should say, go together, verses six and seven, because two of these go together, I've taken these six verbs of imperative and I've talked about them conceptually as forming one compound command. And so that compound command is do not be anxious, but present your requests to God. And I also said in the previous sessions that I see this first command because it's been repeated throughout the book of Philippians a few times, and it's repeated here. I see this command, rejoice in the Lord, as being the main command, the head command, the controlling command in this paragraph. And the rest of these commands, be evident, be, do not be anxious, and so on, are applications of the command 
to rejoice in the Lord. Now, in session 30, we looked at the first imperative verb, rejoice. And in session 31, we looked at the second imperative verb, let your gentleness be evident, in verse 5. The focus of this session, then, is going to be the compound command found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And I've encouraged you in previous sessions to look at several different translations when you read the Scriptures. And so let's do that. Let's take a minute now and put into practice what I've said a few times in these sessions and compare and contrast several different translations. The first one, of course, is the one I've been reading here. And that is the NIV's translation, which we have already read, and so I won't read it again. But here's another translation I like, the ESV, the English Standard Version. And this translation has a more formal style. A little, it's a little more stiff, a little more formal. It's a little more um, exact in trying to follow the uh, form of the words and the order of the words in the original Greek language. And so let me read this passage, these two verses in the ESV. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so that's those two verses, the subparagraph in the ESV. Here's another translation, the New Living Translation. This is a much more free translation in the sense that it tries to make the best English out of the uh, Greek language. And so it's a little bit more um, elastic. It's a little bit more dynamic in the way that it translates. And so let me read that in the New Living Translation. It says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now let's take a second here while we've got these three translations in front of us. And let's note some similarities and differences between them. The first thing I would note in terms of comparing and contrasting these three translations is that both the NIV and the ESV translate the first imperative, the first imperative verb in this compound command. They use the word anxious. Both the ESV and the NIV use the word anxious. But the ESV uses a different word. It uses the word worry. Don't worry about anything. Of course, anxiety and worry are generally synonyms, and so um, they're not all that different, but they are two different words. A second thing I would note in terms of comparing these translations, all three translations add this phrase, about anything. Now, what's interesting about that is, those words don't appear in the original Greek language, and yet all three translations supply them. Now, the reason is by context, but the uh, actual phrase about anything doesn't, there's no Greek words that would correspond to those. And so all three translations have tried to help us understand that the command against anxiety is a broad one in this passage, which is a correct interpretation. A third thing I would note as being um, interesting about the way that these uh, translations differ from each other or are compared to each other is that the NIV says, do not be anxious about ever, anything, but in every situation. But the other two translations actually agree together by saying in everything. Oops. And so the most formal translation and the most informal translation actually use the same phrasing in this section. Another thing I would note about these uh, different translations is that both the NIV and the ESV have some form of this phrase. Now, they differ in their wording, but they both contain the phrase, 
by prayer and petition, that's the NIV, or by prayer and supplication, that's the ESV. But the New Living Translation doesn't have that phrase at all. They have folded the phrase by prayer and petition just into the single word pray. And so that's an interesting difference between the three translations. Another thing to note here is that the NIV and the ESV both say, with thanksgiving. But in the New Living Translation, that phrase is moved to the end of the verse, and it's expanded to say, not just with thanksgiving, but thank him for all he has done. And um, this is one of the things that's nice about looking at a different translation style and comparing it is you might be um, tempted to overlook that phrase with thanksgiving or not really think about what it means, but the New Living Translation Committee, when they put this together, they wanted you to note that part of praying for things is, is being thankful to what God has done. And so by expanding this phrase out and giving this, this phrase, thank him for all that he has done, they've really called attention to part of the passage that might easily be overlooked. Finally, with all three of these translations, we see a different word for the second command. Remember, the first command is to be anxious. It's actually negated, of course. Don't be anxious or don't worry. Two of our translations use the same word, anxious, but in the second command, the second part of the compound command here, they all use a different word. The NIV says, present your requests to God. The ESV says, let your requests be made known. Made known is actually the command itself, and that's the most formal, the most similar to the original language. And the New Living Translation says, just tell God what you need. And so all three of them used a different word choice for the second imperative in this section. Now, again, my preferred translation for all of this is the New International Version, the NIV. And so that's the one I'll be referencing, as always, throughout the rest of this session. And so let's look together at these two verses, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And I want to note again that there are two commands here that form a compound. The first one is, be anxious. And the second one is, Present. Now, this verse 7, which we'll come to in a different session, um, expands and it tells us the results of following these two commands. But uh, the first command is to do not be anxious about anything. And the second command is present your requests to God. Now, the word translated anxious here in verse 6 is the actual imperative verb in this sentence. And the word not, of course, negates that command. It tells us where our activity as human beings should not be. And so that's the first part of this compound. The second part of the compound and the second part of the command is this command, present your requests to God. And as we've seen in comparing these imperatives in the different translations, the, um, the point is to pray. That's what Paul is telling us to do. Instead of being anxious, we should replace anxiety with prayer. That's the Uh, full idea that's given here in verse 6. And of course, the object of presenting our requests, or I should say, the object of presenting or praying is your requests to God. And so Paul is saying, whatever you feel anxiety about, take that to the Lord in prayer. That's really a summary of the commands that are given in these verses. Now, the rest of the session will focus on that first command, do not be anxious about anything. That's where we'll spend the rest of our time in this session today. The first part of the command, of course, is uh, the first part of this compound command is the command, do not be anxious. And the word anxious in the original Greek language is just a word that means to care. If we were to give it its most wooden, most uh, formal meaning, that's the, wor- that's the word that we would use. We would say, do not care. But of course, words can have different types of meaning to them. And so uh, Paul is using this word care in a particular 
uh, way in a particular context here. Now, he has already used this word in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. So earlier in our study of Philippians, we encountered this same word in a different context. And I think you'll see that even though it's the same word, the context makes a big difference in comparing and contrasting how it is used. And so just to give us a little context, let's look together at Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, where the Scripture says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Now, the word that's translated concern in Philippians 2.20 is the same word that's translated do not be anxious about anything here in Philippians chapter 4. And so, in one case, Paul is saying, I want Timothy to come to you because he will be concerned about you. That's chapter 2. In chapter 4, Paul says, don't be concerned about anything. Or to give it a different nuance, Paul says, I'm sending Timothy to you because he'll be anxious about your needs. And in chapter 4, he says, don't be anxious about anything. And so what we're to find out here is that the context makes a big difference in what the same word is suggesting in each one. Now, what ties these two passages together, the one that says, Timothy will show his concern for your welfare, and the one that says, don't be anxious about anything, what ties them together, what, why the same word is used, is that there is an emotional reaction that Paul is describing here. In Philippians 2.20, in describing Timothy and his emotional reaction, Paul is saying, I'm sending Timothy to help you because he cares about you. He has an emotional investment and an emotional reaction to your spiritual welfare. Paul wanted Timothy to come and represent Paul because Timothy loved the Philippians. Timothy wanted the Philippians to grow in their faith. He cared about them. And so the anxiety, if we were to use that word in, in uh, chapter 2, is not a kind of runaway anxiety. It's a concern about things. Now, it is good and right to care about some things in life. Paul is not saying in chapter 4, don't care about anything at any time in any way. Just live a completely carefree life. No, he's not saying that at all. By saying, I'm sending Timothy to you because he cares, there are times when we should care about things. And if, like Paul and Timothy, you led someone to Jesus Christ and spent time discipling that person in the Christian faith, you're going to care about that person's life. You're going to care about them personally. You're going to care about their walk with God and their spiritual life. And when you care about other people, it matters to you if they make good decisions or bad decisions. It matters to you if good things happen to them or bad things happen to them. Think about this sort of as an illustration. If you think that someone you care about might be trending in a bad direction in uh, some way or another, in a negative direction, you're going to have some negative feelings about that. You're going to care in a negative way about that, right? Here's a couple of illustrations. If you have a child, and that child gets a high fever, and that fever remains for a while, you're going to care about that. You're going to, it's going to arouse your concern for that child. Or to use a different context, if you have a teenager, and all of a sudden he or she stops going to school and starts talking about dropping out completely, you're going to care about that. It's going to arouse some feelings within you that are negative because you care about your teenager and you don't want them to trend in a bad direction. You know the road that they could go down if they did drop out of school and if they did stop uh, having some structure in their life. And so you're going to care about that. We call this kind of care concern, right? When someone we know and love is trending in a bad direction, we might say to them, I'm concerned about you. There's a negative awakening in your mind and a negative emotion that follows in your heart. But it's not the same as anxiety. The concern that we have naturally for others is good and appropriate. But it's not the kind of take over your life problem that anxiety can bring. 
And so the first part of this command, this compound command, is do not be anxious. And the word anxious simply means to care, but the context and the type of caring can change from one thing to another. And so let's talk about anxiety. What is anxiety? Anxiety, as I would define it, is a high level of concern. Anxiety is a strong negative emotional response about something bad that could happen but has not happened. Anxiety is a strong negative emotional response about something that could happen but has not happened. And as I said, it's a high level of concern. It's a negative emotion that's so high. If it's it's anxiety at the level that Paul is talking about here in chapter 4 when he commands us not to be anxious, that's a kind of care that is so high in terms of its level of concern that it takes over your body. And you've felt this. You've, You've been anxious at times in your life. Anxiety causes people to have an upset stomach, It causes them to have shallow breathing. It causes their heart rate to increase and other physical symptoms. It's it's a negative emotion that's so strong that it takes over your physiology and changes the way your body reacts. And so anxiety at, at its base is a high level of concern. And the way that Paul is talking about it here in Philippians 4 when he commands us not to be anxious about anything He is saying this kind of anxiety that takes over and runs away with everything. That's what he's commanding us against in this passage. Another thing I would say about anxiety that I think is important is that anxiety is hypothetical. Anxiety happens when you think about the future, and it's a hypothetical future. And so anxiety is future-oriented. It's an emotional response to something that hasn't happened yet because it's future-oriented and hypothetical. Now, the future might not be that far in the future. You know that sometimes you can get anxiety about something that is about to happen. Like if you get suddenly called into a meeting with your boss and you think you might be in trouble for something, you can feel anxiety about the future, but the future is going to be the present in just a few minutes. And so it can be something that is about to happen to you. It can be the near future. Or it could also be um, something that's far away in the future. People get anxious about their death. And maybe they're a young person, and by all um, accounts, since they don't have an illness or anything, they could have a very long time to live. And yet there are some people who live in a state of perpetual anxiety about death when death is really nowhere near on the horizon for them. And so anxiety is about the future, it's future-oriented, and as I said, it's also hypothetical. That is, it's about what could happen in the future, not necessarily what will happen in the future. Here's an example. When a student in high school takes a test, that student might be fully prepared for the test. He or she might have studied for days in advance. They might have stayed up late the night before reviewing everything to get fully prepared for the exam. But that student could still feel anxiety because he or she could forget the thing that they learned. This, this has happened to all of us at some, on some level, right? Where we feel like totally prepared for an exam, totally prepared for something that's happened, and then in the moment, all of a sudden, our mind slips and we forget at least some of what we thought we'd learn, okay? And so if that's ever happened to you in the past, When you come up to another exam, maybe in the same subject, if it's a subject that maybe doesn't come as easily for you, when even though you may have well prepared for that exam, you might feel a high level of anxiety just before you take the exam because you're worried about a hypothetical future. You're worried about something that might happen to you. You're worried that when you sit down to take the test, you might forget. Now that's hypothetical, and it's in the future. But it's happened to all of us. It's happened to all of us where something that's in the future that could happen takes over us, and it causes us to have sweaty palms and shallow breathing and a faster heart rate because we are anxious about what might happen. And so this is the kind of care that Paul is commanding us against here. He's saying you should have a level of care about certain things in your life, but don't let your mind take over 
to the point where you are so consumed with worry about hypothetical things in the future that it actually takes over your physiology where you can't think about anything else and your body has a strong emotional reaction to it. This is the problem with anxiety. Anxiety is hypothetical and it's about the future. Now here's the problem, and here's why anxiety is such a problem. None of us knows the future. Certain things we can make good logical guesses about, but we don't really know what's going to happen to us in the future. And if you've ever been anxious about something that you felt certain would happen and then it didn't happen, you know what I'm talking about. You know how you can be so racked with anxiety about what you expect to happen in the future, and then when it doesn't happen, you're surprised. The anxiety goes away, and it's, replaces, it's replaced with a feeling of surprise. And this is what ought to instruct us about the feeling of anxiety. None of us knows the future. And so since anxiety is about is care, a high level of care that's hypothetical and about the future... That ought to give us pause because none of us really knows what's in the future. And I think maybe the most important thing for us to think about now when we think about anxiety is this, that anxiety is mental. Anxiety is mental. It's your thoughts, your thoughts about the future that lead you to a negative place of anxiety. And again, this all goes back to the word care. You get anxious about things that you care about. And because you care about the outcome of your life, because you care about the outcome of your job situation, because you care about the outcome of your children, because you care about the outcome of the test you're about to take, that care can take over you. You can get in your head about it so much, and your thinking about it can get so out of control that you start thinking only about all the negative outcomes that could possibly happen. And isn't it true that when you think about all the possible negative outcomes of things in the future, that the negative possible outcomes usually far exceed the positive potential outcomes that could happen in the future? And so this is where anxiety comes from. It comes from a mind that is focused on all of the potentially bad things that could happen in the future, whether in the near future or in the far future. Now, in our passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, this is what he has in mind. He is not talking, he, he is talking about this kind of uncontrolled thinking and emotional responses to things in the future that might happen, they're hypothetical, but haven't happened yet. This is what Paul has in mind when he says in verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Now, the second part of this compound command gives us the godly alternative, the godly alternative to anxiety, which is present your requests to God. Now, we'll explore this more in detail in the next session. But in summary, the Bible's answer to anxiety is talk to God about it. Whatever it is you're worried about, whatever the hypothetical bad thing that could happen to you, either in the near future or the far future or everything in between, whatever that is, the Bible says the way to handle it as a Christian is not to let your mind run out of control about it, but instead to take your requests to God. That is, whatever you fear might happen, ask God to prevent that from happening, or whatever you want to happen instead, take that to God in prayer. Specifically, verse 6b says, let your requests be made known to God. Or in our NIV here, present your requests to God. Present them before the Lord. That means to ask Him for help. And again, in the next session, we'll talk in more detail about prayer as an anecdote and as an antidote to anxiety and the different words for prayer that Paul uses here in verse 6. And we'll also talk in a future session about the outcome that Paul says in verse 7. But I can't close this session without reminding you that what Paul commands here, 
Do not be anxious, but rather present your requests to God. They all flow from that first command that we looked at in Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And I suggested to you that that was the controlling command in this passage of Scripture. And that these other commands flow from that as applications of it. And I I think this is really important. This is why prayer is the antidote to anxiety. Because a big part of anxiety has to do with control. Why do we feel anxious? Why do our thoughts spiral out of control about hypothetical things in the future that might happen but might not and in many cases probably won't? Why does that happen to us? Because we want to control the outcome. And all these potential bad things are outside of our control. They're in the future, for one thing, so they're not in our control. And we don't control everything. But who does control everything? God does. God knows the future. God has decreed the future. God has laid out His future plan in the Scriptures for us. And so when the Bible tells us as believers to rejoice in the Lord... I've said to you that means to get your significance, your meaning in life from your relationship with God. And what this does when it, in terms of anxiety and helping us understand and obey the command not to be anxious about anything, but instead to present it to the Lord is this. If our joy comes from knowing the Lord, and if our confidence is in knowing the Lord then we don't have to worry about what's outside of our control. Nothing is outside of God's control. Everything happens according to His sovereign plan. And because you are in Christ, because you've come to the place in your life as a Christian, where you have turned from your sin and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and He's taken away the penalty of your sin, and given you adoption into the family of God, because you are connected by faith to Jesus Christ if you're a Christian, you know that God has the future covered. That whatever His plans for you are will ultimately be for your good and for His glory. And so when the Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord, and then it tells us as an application of rejoicing in the Lord, do not be anxious, but rather present your requests to God. It's telling us to we need to relinquish our desire to control everything. That's where fear comes from. You cannot control everything. And in fact, there are more variables than you can even think about. But if Jesus is your Lord and you rejoice in who He is and what He's done for us, If you choose to make him the object of your thoughts, if you choose to control your thoughts, as I suggested in a previous session, and make him the focus of what you think about, then you can release your grip on control. And we'll jump into all of this in the next session. For now, just remember the big idea for this paragraph, which is this. When you rejoice in the Lord... It will make you gentle, prayerful when anxious, intentional in your thinking, and obedient to God's Word. Or if we just shrink this big idea down to the part of the paragraph that we're looking at, verses 6 and 7, I would say this, a better brand of happiness comes from praying when you feel anxious. And so maybe you're dealing with some anxiety in your life. Maybe you're wondering when things will change and society will return back to what we think of as normal. As as I deliver this message, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. And the lockdowns have caused many people to lose their jobs or caused many businesses to be at the brink of insolvency. And there are many people who are worried about contracting the disease or how they're going to pay their next bills. There there are plenty of things to be anxious about. And if that's where you've come this morning, if you've been dealing with anxiety in your life, we've only started to look at what this passage says about it, but I hope that you'll be able to take from this message 
some important truth about dealing with anxiety. You'll never find happiness if you insist on control because you're a human being and you can't control everything. If you have a need or a feeling of a need to control all things, anxiety will always be right at your doorstep throughout your life. And you'll never know the joy that the Bible commands us to have, to rejoice in the Lord. But if you turn to Jesus Christ when you feel anxious, if you remind yourself that God is in control of all things and God has established your eternity already, the most important thing is settled because of your connection with Jesus Christ, then you can choose a better brand of happiness. Not a brand of happiness that comes as a result of controlling the outcome that you care about, but rather the brand of happiness that comes when you present your life to God, present your future to God, present your fears and your cares to God. And by faith, believe that God has got it covered. A better brand of happiness comes from praying when you feel anxious. And so let me encourage you, if you feel anxiety today, tomorrow, any time in the future, remember this passage and take it to the Lord in prayer. This is a better brand of happiness. At this time, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the message today. And so I want to encourage you to take out your device again and tap on the Sunday tab and then tap on the back of the virtual response card. And if you have anything that you're anxious about that we can pray with you about, just jot us a note in the little field there that gives you uh, an opportunity to submit a prayer request and let me know if this is something that just the elders and I should pray for or if you want others in the church to pray for it as well. We'll send it out to our prayer team. Also on that uh, virtual response card, there's a line that says, I would like to know more about how to become a Christian. And if that's you, if you've, if you've come to watch this message this morning and you're not a Christian or you're not sure you're a Christian, we would love to talk with you more about what it means to receive forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And so if you just give us your contact information in the back of the virtual response card and check that box that says, I would like to know more about how to become a Christian, we'll get in touch with you and show you what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me as we return to worship and song again? Father, thank you for this passage. We thank you, Lord, for the, the antidote to worry that you give us in your word and I pray, Lord, for anyone who is feeling anxious, whether it's about COVID-19 or something else, Lord, I pray that you would, in faith, cause them to turn to you and put their faith and trust in you alone. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who, or watching this who is not uh, a Christian, Lord, that they would see that you gave yourself for us to, re to redeem us and save us from the runaway anxieties that come so easy to us. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause... Uh, anyone who is not a Christian to reach out to us or just to reach out in faith to you and believe in Christ our Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity and the command that we have to rejoice in you. We thank you that in Christ we can find our joy and our significance in life. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to choose that each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please worship with us again in song. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is life, lead me in the way everlasting. Don't ever stop, don't ever stop.
Before we close this online service, I want to let you know that we are very close to setting a date to resume our Sunday worship services here at Calvary. The elders and I have met a couple of times over the past uh, week or so, and we've uh, worked out what we think is a good date for us to restart, and we've put together a plan uh, to try to ensure safety um, as we restart our services. So uh, thank you for praying for us, and uh, just watch your email. We'll be making announcements about that really soon. Uh, so stay tuned, and you'll be hearing from me about this uh, very soon. Once again, I want to thank you so much for continuing to support our church's ministry financially. And uh, if you'd like to join, because you're not supporting us financially, we would love to uh, just have you join with those who are supporting us. And there's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can just mail us a check to the church, and the address of our church is on the screen. Or if you want to set up online giving, if you want to just do a one-time gift, or if you want to set up recurring giving, we have instructions that we would be happy to send you. They're, they're step by step, and so you just it shows you every screen that you'll see and how to do it. So it's pretty simple to set up. Just email us at info at calvary-bible.org, and we will send you those instructions, let you know how to set up online giving. Thanks again for watching, for praying for us, for praying for one another, for supporting God's work in our church. And let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for how you have taken care of us, how you provided for us, Lord, how you've seen us through sickness, how you've uh, just met our needs, Lord, in this uh, strange time in which we live. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to look to you in faith each day as we go forward. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the joy that your word promises as we do that. And so, God, I pray for our church that we would walk with you daily, that we would grow stronger in our faith, uh, even through these strange times of testing that we're experiencing now. And Lord, that uh, you would give us the opportunity to resume meeting together very soon, and we look forward to the day when we can sing together and when we can uh, worship you and praise you and learn together. And so, Lord, until then, I pray your sustaining grace for us and give us grace to walk with you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I hope you have a great week.